Disc 2. When supper was really finished at last, and each animal felt that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe, they gathered round the glowing embers of the great wood fire. After they had chatted for a time about things in general, the badger said heartily, Now then, tell us the news from your part of the world. How's old Toad going on? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely. Another smash-up only last week, and a bad one. You see, he will insist on driving himself, and he's hopelessly incapable. If he'd only employ a decent, steady, well-trained animal, pay him good wages and leave everything to him, he'd get on all right. But no, he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver, and nobody can teach him anything. He's been in hospital three times, put in the mole, and as for the fines he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. Yes, and that's part of the trouble, continued the rat. Toad's rich, we all know, but he's not a millionaire, and he's a hopelessly bad driver, and quite regardless of law and order. Killed or ruined, it's got to be one of the two things sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends. Oughtn't we to do something? The badger went through a bit of hard thinking. Now look here, he said at last rather severely. Of course, you know I can't do anything now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No animal, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic or even moderately active during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy, some actually asleep. All are weather-bound, more or less, and all are resting from arduous days and nights during which every muscle in them has been severely tested and every energy kept at full stretch. Very well, then, continued the badger. But when once the year's really turned and the nights are shorter and one feels fidgety and wanting to be up and doing by sunrise, you know... Both animals nodded gravely. They knew. Well then, went on the badger, we'll take Toad seriously in hand. We'll bring him back to reason, by force if need be. We'll make him be a sensible Toad. We'll... You're asleep, rat. <laughs> Not me, said the rat waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times since supper, said the mole, laughing. He himself was feeling quite wakeful and even lively, though he didn't know why. The reason was, of course, that being naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding, the situation of Badger's house exactly suited him and made him feel at home, while the rat, who slept every night in a bedroom, the windows of which opened on a breezy river, naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive. Well, it's time we were all in bed, said the badger, getting up and fetching flat candlesticks. Come along, you two, and I'll show you your quarters, and take your time tomorrow morning, breakfast at any hour you please. He conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft. The badger's winter stores, which indeed were visible everywhere, took up half the room. Piles of apples, turnips and potatoes, baskets full of nuts and jars of honey, but the two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting, and the linen on them, though coarse, was clean and smelled beautifully of lavender. And the mole and the water rat, shaking off their garments in some thirty seconds, tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment. The two tired animals came down to breakfast very late next morning, Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, had retired to his study and settled himself in an armchair with his legs up on another and a red cotton handkerchief over his face and was being busy in the usual way at this time of the year. The front doorbell clanged loudly. Thought I should find you here all right, said the otter cheerfully. They were all in a great state of alarm along Riverbank when I arrived this morning. Rat never been home all night, nor mole either. Something dreadful must have happened, they said, and the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course. But I knew that when people were in any fix, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow, so I came straight off here, through the wildwood and the snow. But halfway across I came on a rabbit, sitting on a stump, cleaning his silly face with his paws. I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wildwood last night by one of them, it was the talk of the burrows, he said, how Mole, Mr. Rat's particular friend, was in a bad fix, how he had lost his way, and they were up and out hunting, and were chiving him round and round. 
Weren't you at all, uh, nervous? asked the Mole, some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the wild wood. Nervous? The otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth as he laughed. I'd give em nerves if any of them tried anything on with me. Here, Mole, fry me some slices of ham like the good little chap you are. I'm frightfully hungry, and I've got any amount to say to Ratty here. Haven't seen him for an age. A plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more when the badger entered, yawning and rubbing his eyes, and greeted them all in his quiet, simple way with kind inquiries for everyone. It must be getting on for luncheon time, he remarked to the otter. Better stop and have it with us. You must be hungry in this cold morning. Rather, replied the otter, winking at the mole. Presently, they all sat down to luncheon together. The mole found himself placed next to Mr. Badger, and as the other two were still deep in river gossip, from which nothing could divert them, he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him. Once well underground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you, and nothing can get at you. You're entirely your own master, and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say. Things go on all the same overhead, and you let them, and don't bother about them. When you want to, up you go, and there the things are, waiting for you. The badger simply beamed on him. That's exactly what I see, he replied. There's no security or peace and tranquility except underground. Then, if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why, a dig, a scrape, there you are. If you feel your house is a bit too big, you stop up a hole or two and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on you by fellows looking over your wall, and above all, no weather. Look at Rat now. A couple of feet of flood water and he's got to move into higher lodgings. Uncomfortable, inconveniently situated, and horribly expensive. Take Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall, quite the best house in these parts, as a house. But supposing a fire breaks out, where's Toad? Supposing tiles are blown off, or walls sink or crack, or windows get broken, where's Toad? Supposing the rooms are drafty, I hate a draft myself, where's Toad? No, up and out of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last, that's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily, and the badger, in consequence, got very friendly with him. When uh, lunch is over... He said, I'll take you all round this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be, you do. When they got back to the kitchen again, they found the rat walking up and down, very restless. The underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves, and he seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. So he had his overcoat on and his pistols thrust into his belt again. Come along, Mole, he said anxiously as soon as he caught sight of them. We must get off while it's daylight. Don't want to spend another night in the wild wood again. It'll be all right, my fine fellow, said the otter. I'm coming along with you, and I know every path blindfold. And if there's a head that needs to be punched, you can confidently rely upon me to punch it. You really needn't fret, Ratty, added the badger placidly. My passages run further than you think, and I bolt holes to the edge of the wood in several directions, though I don't care for everybody to know about them. When you really have to go, you shall leave by one of my shortcuts. Meantime, make yourself easy and sit down again. The rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and attend to his river, so the badger, taking up his lantern again, led the way along a damp and airless tunnel that wound and dipped, part vaulted, part hewn through solid rock, for a weary distance that seemed to be miles. At last, daylight began to show itself confusedly through tangled growth overhanging the mouth of the passage, and the badger, bidding them a hasty goodbye, pushed them hurriedly through the opening, made everything look as natural as possible again with creepers, brushwood and dead leaves, and retreated. They found themselves standing on the very edge of the wild wood. Rocks and brambles and tree roots behind them, confusedly heaped and tangled, in front a great space of quiet fields, hemmed by lines of hedges, black on the snow, and far ahead a glint of the familiar old river, 
while the wintry sun hung red and low on the horizon. The otter, as knowing all the paths, took charge of the party, and they made swiftly for home, for firelight, and the familiar things it played on, for the voice, sounding cheerily outside their window, of the river that they knew and trusted in all its moods. The sheep ran, huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet, their heads thrown back, and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air as the two animals hastened by in high spirits with much chatter and laughter. They were returning across country after a long day's outing with Otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams, tributary to their own river, had their first small beginnings, and the shades of the short winter day were closing in on them, and they had still some distance to go. It looks as if we were coming to a village, said the mole somewhat dubiously, slackening his pace as the track that had in time become a path and then had developed into a lane now handed them over to the charge of a well-metalled road. Oh, never mind, said the rat. At this season of the year they're all safe indoors by this time, sitting round the fire. Men, women and children, dogs and cats and all. We shall slip through all right without any bother or unpleasantness. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of dusky orange-red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Once beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness the friendly fields again and they braced themselves for the last long stretch. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper, as it was pitch dark, and it was all a strange country for him as far as he knew, and he was following obediently in the wake of the rat, leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was, his shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the straight grey road in front of him, so he did not notice poor Mole when suddenly the summons reached him and took him like an electric shock. He stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture the fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in fullest flood. Home. That was what they meant those caressing appeals, those soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at that moment, his old home that he had hurriedly forsaken and never sought again that day when he first found the river. And now it was sending out its scouts and its messengers to capture him and bring him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he had hardly given it a thought, so absorbed had he been in his new life, in all its pleasures, its surprises, its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood up before him in the darkness. Shabby indeed, and small and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home he had made for himself, the home he had been so happy to get back to after his day's work. And the home had been happy with him too, evidently, and was missing him, and wanted him back, and was telling him so. The call was clear, the summons was plain. He must obey it instantly and go. Ratty, he called, full of joyful excitement. Hold on, come back, I want you quick. Oh, come along, Mole, do, replied the rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, you don't understand. It's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it, and it's close by here, really quite close, and I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty, please, please come back. The rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice and he was much taken up with the weather, for he too could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. Mo, we mustn't stop now, really, he called back. It's late, and the snow's coming on again. I'm not sure of the way. And the rat pressed forward on his way without waiting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road, 
his heart torn asunder, and a big sob gathering, gathering somewhere low down inside him to leap up to the surface presently he knew in passionate escape. But even under such a test as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. With a wrench that tore his very heartstrings, he set his face down the road and followed submissively in the track of the rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they would do when they got back, and how jolly a fire of logs in the parlour would be, and what a supper he meant to eat, never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind. At last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further, and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, Look here, Mole, old chap, you seem dead tired. No talk left in you, and your feet dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a moment and rest. The snow has held off so far, and the best part of our journey is over. The Mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried to control himself, for he felt it surely coming. The sob he had fought with so long refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way to the air, and then another, and another, and others, thick and fast, till poor Mole at last gave up the struggle and cried freely and helplessly and openly. The rat, astonished and dismayed, said very quietly and sympathetically, What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter? Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out between the upheavals of his chest that followed one upon another so quickly and held back speech and choked it as it came. <laughs> I know it's a shabby, dingy little place, not like your cosy quarters or Toad's beautiful hall or Badger's great house, <laughs> but it was my own little home and I was fond of it and I went away. <laughs> I forgot all about it, and then I smelled it suddenly on the road when I called and you wouldn't listen, Rat, and I had to leave it, though I was smelling it all the time. I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone and had one look at it, Ratty. Only one look. It was close by, but you wouldn't turn back, Ratty. You wouldn't turn back. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Sobs again took full charge of him, preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time, he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I have been. A pig, that's me. Just a pig. A plain pig. He waited till Mole's sobs became only intermittent. Then he rose from his seat and, remarking carelessly, well, now we'd really better be getting on, old chap, set off up the road again over the toilsome way they had come. Wherever are you going to, Ratty? cried the tearful Mole, looking up in alarm. We're going to find that home of yours, old fellow, replied the Rat pleasantly. So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm, and we'll very soon be back there again. Still snuffling, pleading, and reluctant, Mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road by his imperious companion. They moved on in silence for some little way, when suddenly the rat was conscious, through his arm that was linked in Mole's, of a faint sort of electric thrill that was passing down that animal's body. Instantly he disengaged himself, fell back a pace, and waited all attention. The signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment rigid, while his uplifted nose, quivering slightly, felt the air. Then a short, quick run forward, a fault, a check, a try back, and then a slow, steady, confident advance. The rat, much excited, kept close to his heels as the mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field open and trackless and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the rat was on the alert and promptly followed him down the tunnel to which his unerring nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless, and the earthy smell was strong, and it seemed a long time to rat ere the passage ended and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. The mole struck a match, and by its light 
the rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot, and directly facing them was Mole's little front door, with Mole End painted in Gothic lettering over the bell pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it, and the rat, looking round him, saw they were in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and on the other, a roller. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statuary, Garibaldi, and the infant Samuel, and Queen Victoria, and other heroes of modern Italy. Down one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley, with benches along it, and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. Mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so dear to him, and he hurried Rat through the door, lit a lamp in the hall, and took one glance round his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of the long-neglected house, and its narrow, meagre dimensions, its worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. Oh, Ratty! he cried dismally. Why ever did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this, when you might have been at River Bank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire with all your own nice things about you? The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, and lighting lamps and candles and sticking them up everywhere. What a capital little house this is, he called out cheerily. So compact, so well planned. Everything here and everything in its place. We'll make a jolly night of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So, this is the parlour. Splendid. Your own idea, those little sleeping bunks in the wall? Capital. Now, I'll fetch the wood and coals, and you get a duster, Mole. You'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table. Try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his inspiriting companion, the Mole roused himself and dusted and polished with energy and heartiness, while the Rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He hailed the Mole to come and warm himself, but Mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair and burying his face in his duster. Rat, he moaned, how about your supper? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in said the rat reproachfully. Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser, quite distinctly, and everybody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere in the neighbourhood. Arouse yourself, pull yourself together, and come with me and forage. They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard and turning out every drawer. The result was not so very depressing after all, though, of course, it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of captain's biscuits, nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. There's a banquet for you, observed the rat as he arranged the table. I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight. No bread, groaned the mole dolorously. No butter, no, no patty de foie gras, no champagne, continued the rat, grinning. And that reminds me, what's that little door at the end of the passage? Your cellar, of course. Every luxury in this house, just you wait a minute. He made for the cellar door, and presently reappeared, somewhat dusty, with a bottle of beer in each paw and another under each arm. Self-indulgent beggar you seem to be, Mo, he observed. Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I ever was in. Now, wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so homelike, they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mo. Tell us all about it and how you came to make it what it is. Then, while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks and mustard, which he mixed in an egg cup, the mole, his bosom still heaving with the stress of his recent emotion, related, somewhat shyly at first, but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject, how this was planned, and how that was thought out, and how this was got through a windfall from an aunt, and that was a wonderful find and a bargain, and this other thing was bought out of laborious savings and a certain amount of going without, Rat, who was desperately hungry but strove to conceal it, nodding seriously and saying, wonderful and most remarkable, at intervals when the chance for an observation was given him. 
the rat had just got seriously to work with the sardine opener when sounds were heard from the forecourt without, sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel, and a confused murmur of tiny voices, while broken sentences reached them. Now, all in a line, hold the lantern up a bit, Tommy. Clear your throats first. No coughing after I say one, two, three. Oh, where's young Bill? You come on, do. We're all awaiting. What's up? inquired the rat, pausing in his labours. I think it must be the field mice, replied the mole with a touch of pride in his manner. They go round carol singing regularly at this time of the year. They're quite an institution in these parts. They come to mole end last of all, and I used to give them hot drinks and supper too sometimes when I could afford it. It will be like old times to hear them again. Let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red-worsted comforters round their throats, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jigging for warmth. With bright beady eyes, they glanced shyly at each other. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air, singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers composed and handed down to be sung at Yule-time. "'Very well sung, boys!' cried the rat heartily. "'And now come along in all of you and warm yourselves by the fire and have something hot!' "'Yes, come along, field mice!' cried the mole eagerly. "'This is quite like old times. Shut the door after you. Pull up that settle to the fire. Now, you just wait a minute while we—' "'Oh, ratty, whatever are we doing?' We've nothing to give them. You leave all that to me, said the masterful rat. Here, you with the lantern. I want to talk to you. Are there any shops open at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir, replied the field mouse respectfully. At this time of the year, our shops keep open to all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once, you and your lantern, and you get me. Here, much muttered conversation ensued. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice, perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to enjoyment of the fire and toasted their chilblains till they tingled, while the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them recite the names of his numerous brothers, who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out a caroling this year, but look forward very shortly to winning the parental consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be old Burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible mole, the very thing. Now we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, mole, while I draw the corks. It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater well into the red heart of the fire, and soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way, and wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting he had ever been cold in all his life. The latch clicked, the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. Under the generalship of Rat, everybody was set to do something or to fetch something. In a very few minutes, supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table in a sort of dream, saw a lately barren board set thick with savoury comforts, saw his little friends' faces brighten and beam as they fell to without delay, and then let himself loose, for he was famished indeed, on the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out after all. As they ate, they talked of old times, and the field mice gave him the local gossip up to date and answered as well as they could the hundred questions he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing, only taking care that each guest had what he wanted and plenty of it, and that Mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful and showering wishes of the season, with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for the small brothers and sisters at home. When the door had closed on the last of them, and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked the fire up, drew their chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale, and discussed the events of a long day. 
At last, the rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, then, I'll take this. What a ripping little house this is. Everything so handy. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in the blankets, and slumber gathered him forthwith. The weary mole also was glad to turn in without delay, and soon had his head on his pillow in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things which had long been unconsciously a part of him. He knew he must return to the larger stage, but it was good to think he had this to come back to, this place which was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again, and could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. It was a bright morning in the early part of summer. The mole and the water rat had been up since dawn, very busy on matters connected with boats and the opening of the boating season, painting and varnishing, mending paddles, repairing cushions, hunting for missing boat hooks, and so on, and were finishing breakfast in their little parlour and eagerly discussing their plans for the day when a heavy knock sounded at the door. Bother, said the rat, all over egg. See you it is, mole, like a good chap, since you've finished. The mole went to attend the summons, and the rat heard him utter a cry of surprise. Then he flung the parlour door open and announced with much importance, Mr. Badger! This was a wonderful thing indeed, that the badger should pay a formal call on them, or indeed, on anybody. The badger strode heavily into the room, and stood looking at the two animals with an expression full of seriousness. The rat let his egg-spoon fall on the tablecloth, and sat open-mouthed. The hour has come, said the badger at last with great solemnity. Uh, what hour? asked the rat uneasily, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. Whose hour, you should rather say, replied the badger. Why, Toad's hour, the hour of Toad. I said I would take him in hand as soon as the winter was well over, and I'm going to take him in hand today. Toad's hour, of course, cried the mole delightedly. Hooray! I remember now. We'll teach him to be a sensible Toad. This very morning, continued the badger, taking an armchair, as I learned last night from a trustworthy source, another new and exceptionally powerful motor car will arrive at Toad Hall on approval or return. We must be up and doing ere it is too late. You two animals will accompany me instantly to Toad Hall, and the work of rescue shall be accomplished. They reached the carriage drive of Toad Hall to find, as the badger had anticipated, a shiny new motor car of great size painted a bright red, Toad's favourite colour, standing in front of the house. As they neared the door, it was flung open, and Mr. Toad, arrayed in goggles, cap, gaiters, and enormous overcoat, came swaggering down the steps, drawing on his gauntleted gloves. Hello! Come on, you fellows! he cried cheerfully on catching sight of them. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly... to come for a jolly... for a... a... jolly... His hearty accents faltered and fell away as he noticed the stern, unbending look on the countenances of his silent friends, and his invitation remained unfinished. The badger strode up the steps. Take him inside, he said sternly to his companions. When the four of them stood together in the hall, the badger said, First of all, take those ridiculous things off. Shan't, replied Toad with great spirit. What is the meaning of this gross outrage? I demand an instant explanation. Take them off him then, you two, ordered the badger briefly. They had to lay Toad out on the floor, kicking and calling all sorts of names, before they could get to work properly. Then the rat sat on him, and the mole got his motor clothes off him bit by bit, and they stood him up on his legs again. You knew it must come to this sooner or later, Toad, the badger explained severely. You've disregarded all the warnings we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money your father left you and you're getting us animals a bad name in the district by your furious driving and your smashes and your rows with the police. Now, you're a good fellow in many respects, and I don't want to be too hard on you. I'll make one more effort to bring you to reason. You will come with me into the smoking room, 
and there you will hear some facts about yourself, and we'll see whether you come out of that room the same toad that you went in. After some three quarters of an hour, the door opened, and the badger reappeared, solemnly leading by the paw a very limp and dejected toad. His skin hung baggily about him, his legs wobbled, and his cheeks were furrowed by the tears so plentifully called forth by the badger's moving discourse. Sit down there, toad, said the badger kindly, pointing to a chair. My friends, I am pleased to inform you that toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He is truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and he has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever. I have his solemn promise to that effect. That is very good news, said the mole gravely. Uh, very good news indeed, observed the rat dubiously. If only, if only... He was looking very hard at Toad as he said this, and could not help thinking he perceived something vaguely resembling a twinkle in that animal's still sorrowful eye. There's only one thing more to be done, continued the gratified badger. Toad, I want you solemnly to repeat before your friends here what you fully admitted to me in the smoking room just now. First, you were sorry for what you've done, and you see the folly of it all. There was a long, long pause. Toad looked desperately this way and that, while the other animals waited in grave silence. At last, he spoke. No, he said, a little sullenly but stoutly. I'm not sorry, and it wasn't folly at all. It was simply glorious. What? cried the badger, greatly scandalized. You backsliding animal, didn't you tell me just now in there? Oh, yes, in there, said Toad impatiently. I'd have said anything in there. You're so eloquent, dear Badger, and so moving and so convincing and put all your points so frightfully well. You can do what you like with me in there, and you know it. But I've been searching my mind since and going over things in it, and I find that I'm not a bit sorry or repentant, really, so it's no earthly good saying I am now, is it? Then you don't promise said the badger, never to touch a motor car again. Certainly not, replied Toad emphatically. On the contrary, I faithfully promise that the very first motor car I see, poop, poop, off I go in it. Very well then, said the badger firmly, rising to his feet. Since you won't yield to persuasion, we'll try what force can do. I feared it would come to this all along. You've often asked us three to come and stay with you, Toad, in this handsome house of yours. Well, now we're going to. When we've converted you to a proper point of view, we may quit, but not before. Take him upstairs, you two, and lock him up in his bedroom while we arrange matters between ourselves. It's for your own good, Toady, you know, said the rat kindly, as Toad, kicking and struggling, was hauled up the stairs by his two faithful friends. Think what fun we shall all have together, just as we used to, when you've quite got over this, this painful attack of yours. We'll take great care of everything for you till you're well, Toad, said the Mole, and we'll see your money isn't wasted as it has been. No more of those regrettable incidents with the police, Toad, said the Rat, as they thrust him into his bedroom. And no more weeks in hospital being ordered about by female nurses, Toad, added the Mole, turning the key on him. They descended the stair, Toad shouting abuse at them through the keyhole and the three friends then met in conference on the situation. Ah, it's going to be a tedious business, said the badger, sighing. I've never seen Toad so determined. However, we will see it out. He must never be left an instant unguarded. We shall have to take it in turns to be with him till the poison has worked itself out of his system. Each animal took it in turns to sleep in Toad's room at night, and they divided the day up between them. At first, Toad was undoubtedly very trying to his careful guardians. When his violent paroxysms possessed him, he would arrange bedroom chairs in rude resemblance of a motor car and would crouch on the foremost of them, bent forward and staring fixedly ahead, making uncouth and ghastly noises till the climax was reached when, turning a complete somersault, he would lie prostrate amidst the ruins of the chairs, apparently completely satisfied for the moment. As time passed, however, these painful seizures grew gradually less frequent, and his friends strove to divert his mind into fresh channels. But his interest in other matters did not seem to revive, and he grew apparently languid and depressed. One fine morning, the rat, 
whose turn it was to go on duty, went upstairs to relieve Badger, whom he found fidgeting to be off and stretch his legs in a long ramble round his wood and down his earths and burrows. Toad's still in bed, he told the rat outside the door. Can't get much out of him except, oh, leave him alone, he wants nothing, perhaps he will be better presently, it may pass off in time, don't be unduly anxious and so on. Now, you look out, rat, when Toad's quiet and submissive, then he's at his artfulest. There's sure to be something up. I know him. Well, now I must be off. How are you today, old chap? inquired the rat cheerfully as he approached Toad's bedside. He had to wait some minutes for an answer. At last, a feeble voice replied, ah, Thank you so much, dear Ratty. So good of you to inquire. But first, tell me how you are yourself and the excellent mole. Oh, we're all right, replied the rat. Mole, he added incautiously, is going out for a run round with Badger. They'll be out till luncheon time, so you and I will spend a pleasant morning together, and I'll do my best to amuse you. Now, jump up, there's a good fellow. Don't lie moping there on a fine morning like this. Dear kind rat, murmured Toad, how little you realise my condition and how very far I am from jumping up now, if ever. <coughs> but do not trouble about me. I, I hate being a burden to my friends, and I do not expect to be one much longer, indeed. I almost hope not. Well, I hope not, too, said the rat heartily. You've been a fine bother to us all this time, and I'm glad to hear it's going to stop. And in weather like this and the boating season just beginning, it's too bad of your toad. I'm a nuisance, I know, replied the toad languidly. You are indeed, said the rat. But I tell you, I'd take any trouble on earth for you if only you'd be a sensible animal. If I thought that ratty, murmured toad more feebly than ever, then I would beg you, for the last time, probably, <coughs> to step round to the village as quickly as possible, even now it may be too late, and, and fetch the doctor. Why, what do you want a doctor for? inquired the rat, coming closer and examining him. Certainly his voice was weaker, and his manner much changed. Surely you have noticed of late, murmured Toad. But no, why should you? Noticing things is only a trouble. Tomorrow, indeed, you may be saying to yourself, Oh, if only I had noticed sooner, if only I had done something. But no, it's a trouble. Never mind. Forget that I asked. <coughs> Look here, old man, said the rat, beginning to get rather alarmed. Of course I'll fetch a doctor to you if you really think you want him. But you can hardly be bad enough for that yet. Let's talk about something else. I dear, dear friend said Toad with a sad smile. That talk can do little in a case like this. Or doctors either, for that matter. Still, one must grasp at the slightest straw. And by the way, while you are about it, I hate to give you additional trouble. But would you mind, at the same time, asking the lawyer to step up? A lawyer? Well, he must be really bad the affrighted rat said to himself as he hurried from the room, not forgetting, however, to lock the door carefully behind him. Outside he stopped to consider. The other two were far away, and he had no one to consult. It's best to be on the safe side, he said, so he ran off to the village on his errand of mercy. The toad, who had hopped lightly out of bed as soon as he heard the key turned in the lock, watched him eagerly from the window till he disappeared down the carriage drive. Then, laughing heartily, he dressed as quickly as possible in the smartest suit he could lay hands on at the moment, filled his pockets with cash, which he took from a small drawer in the dressing table, and next, knotting the sheets from his bed together and tying one end of the improvised rope round the central mullion of the handsome Tudor window, which formed such a feature of his bedroom, he scrambled out, slid lightly to the ground, and taking the opposite direction to the rat, marched off light-heartedly, whistling a merry tune. It was a gloomy luncheon for Rat, when the badger and the mole at length returned, and he had to face them at table with his pitiful and unconvincing story. Meanwhile, Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road some miles from home. At first he had taken bypaths and crossed many fields in case of pursuit, but now, feeling by this time safe from recapture, and the sun smiling brightly on him, 
and all nature joining in a chorus of approval to the song of self-praise that his own heart was singing to him, he almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. Ha! Smart piece of work, that, he remarked to himself, chuckling. Brain against brute force, and brain came out on the top, as it's bound to do. Poor old ratty! Why, won't he catch it when the badger gets back? A worthy fellow, Ratty, with many uh, good qualities, but very little intelligence. He strode along, his head in the air, till he reached a little town, where the sign of the Red Lion, swinging across the road halfway down the main street, reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day, and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. He marched into the inn, ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at so short a notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal when an only too familiar sound approaching down the street made him start and fall a trembling all over. The poop poop drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn yard and come to a stop, and Toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion. Presently, the party entered the coffee room, hungry, talkative and gay, voluble on their experiences of the morning and the merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears for a time. At last he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly, paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside, sauntered round quietly to the inn yard. There cannot be any harm, he said to himself, in my only just looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended. Toad walked slowly round it, inspecting, criticising, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, I wonder if this sort of car starts easily. Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it, as the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him, body and soul. As if in a dream, he found himself somehow seated in the driver's seat. As if in a dream, he pulled the lever and swung the car round the yard and out through the archway. And as if in a dream, all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was Toad once more. Toad at his best and highest. Toad, the terror, the traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew, and the car responded with sonorous drone. The miles were eaten up under him as he sped he knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of what might come to him. To my mind, observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us. <laughs> Let me see. He has been found guilty on the clearest evidence, first of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly of driving to the public danger, and thirdly of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clark, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences, without, of course, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, because there isn't any? The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Supposing you were to say twelve months for the theft, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and fifteen years for the cheek, which is pretty bad sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box, those figures, if added together correctly, tot up to 19 years. So you had better make it around 20 years and be on the safe side. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman approvingly. Prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. It's going to be 20 years for you this time, and mind, if you appear before us again upon any charge whatever... We shall have to deal with you very seriously.
Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains, and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting. Across the marketplace, where the playful populace assailed him with jeers, carrots, and popular catchwords, past hooting schoolchildren, their innocent faces lit up with the pleasure they ever derive from the sight of a gentleman in difficulties. Across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, below the spiky portcullis, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead, past guardrooms full of grinning soldiery off-duty, up time-worn winding stairs, across courtyards where mastiffs strained at their leash and poured the air to get at him, past ancient warders, their halberds leant against the wall, dozing over a pasty and a flagon of brown ale, on and on till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There, at last, they paused, where an ancient jailer sat fingering a bunch of mighty keys. The jailer nodded grimly, laying his withered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key creaked in the lock, the great door clanged behind them, and Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of merry England. Toad, finding himself immured in a dank and noisome dungeon, and knowing that all the grim darkness of a medieval fortress lay between him and the outer world of sunshine and well-metalled highroads, where he had lately been so happy, flung himself at full length on the floor and shed bitter tears and abandoned himself to dark despair. Uh, this is the end of everything, he said. At least it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. The popular and handsome toad, the rich and hospitable toad, the toad so free and careless and debonair. How can I hope to be ever set at large again, who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor car in such an audacious manner, and for such lurid and imaginative cheek bestowed upon such a number of fat, red-faced policemen? <laughs> Here his sobs choked him. Stupid animal that I was. Now I must languish in this dungeon till people who are proud to say they knew me have forgotten the very name of Toad. Oh, wise old badger. Oh, clever, intelligent rat and sensible mole. What sound judgments, what a knowledge of men and matters you possess. Oh, unhappy and forsaken. With lamentations such as these, he passed his days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals or intermediate light refreshments, though the grim and ancient jailer, knowing that Toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts, and indeed luxuries, could by arrangement be sent in, at a price, from outside. Now, the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. This kind-hearted girl, pitying the misery of Toad, said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy and getting so thin. You let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. He was tired of Toad and his sulks and his airs and his meanness. So that day she went on her errand of mercy and knocked at the door of Toad's cell. Now cheer up, Toad, she said coaxingly on entering, and sit up and dry your eyes and be a sensible animal, and do try and eat a bit of dinner. See, I brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. It was bubble and squeak between two plates, and its fragrance filled the narrow cell. The penetrating smell of cabbage reached the nose of Toad as he lay prostrate in his misery on the floor and gave him the idea for a moment that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he had imagined. But still he wailed and kicked with his legs and refused to be comforted. So the wise girl retired for the time, but of course a good deal of the smell of hot cabbage remained behind, as it will do. When the girl returned, some hours later, she carried a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, 
very brown on both sides, with the butter running through the holes in it in great golden drops like honey from the honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast simply talked to Toad, and with no uncertain voice. Talked of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright frosty mornings, of cosy parlour firesides on winter evenings when one's slippered feet were propped on the fender, of the purring of contented cats and the twitter of sleepy canaries. Toad sat up on end once more, dried his eyes, sipped his tea and munched his toast, and soon began talking freely about himself and the house he lived in and his doings there and how important he was and what a lot his friends thought of him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was, and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall, she said. It sounds beautiful. Toad Hall, said the toad proudly, is an eligible, self-contained gentleman's residence, very unique, dating in part from the 14th century, but replete with every modern convenience. Up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office and golf links, suitable for... Bless the animal, said the girl, laughing. I don't want to take it. Tell me something real about it. But first, wait till I fetch you some more tea and toast. She tripped away and presently returned with a fresh trayful, and Toad, pitching into the toast with avidity, his spirits quite restored to their usual level, told her about the boathouse and the fish pond and the old wall kitchen garden, and about the pigsties and the stables and the pigeon house and the hen house, and about the dairy and the wash house and the china cupboards and the linen presses, and about the banqueting hall and the fun they had had there, when the other animals were gathered round the table and Toad was at his best, singing songs, telling stories, carrying on generally. Then she wanted to know about his animal friends, and was very interested in all he had to tell her about them, and how they lived, and what they did to pass their time. When she said good night, having filled his water jug and shaken up his straw for him, Toad was very much the same sanguine, self-satisfied animal that he had been of old. He curled himself up in the straw and had an excellent night's rest and the pleasantest of dreams. They had many interesting talks together after that, as the dreary days went on, and the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad and thought it a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very trivial offence. One morning the girl was very thoughtful and answered at random and did not seem to Toad to be paying proper attention to his witty sayings and sparkling comments. Toad, she said presently, just listen, please. I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. There, there, said Toad graciously and affably. Never mind, think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute, Toad, said the girl. As I said, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. She does the washing for all the prisoners in this castle. She takes out the washing on Monday morning and brings it in on Friday evening. This is a Thursday. Now, this is what occurs to me. You're very rich, at least you're always telling me so, and she's very poor. A few pounds wouldn't make any difference to you, and it would mean a lot to her. Now, I think if she were properly approached, you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many respects, particularly about the figure. Well, not, said the toad in a huff. I have a very elegant figure, for what I am. So is my aunt, replied the girl, for what she is. But have it your own way you horrid, proud, ungrateful animal, when I'm sorry for you and tried to help you. Yes, yes, that's all right. Thank you very much indeed, said the toad hurriedly. But look here. You wouldn't surely have Mr. Toad of Toad Hall going about the country disguised as a washerwoman? Then you can stop here as a toad, replied the girl with much spirit. I suppose you want to go off in a coach and four. Honest Toad was always ready to admit himself in the wrong. You are a good, kind, clever girl, he said and I am indeed a proud and a stupid toad. Introduce me to your worthy aunt, if you will be so kind, and I have no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both parties. End of Disc 2